Okay. Welcome back, everyone. And um, I've just uh, turned on the recording for the session as well. So others can listen to it. Okay. Before we get into the next chapter, chapter nine, are there any other questions um, anybody would like to ask? Okay. We're going to go, go now to chapter nine, which is on nurturing your faith. Right? So we want to talk about nurturing our faith. So our faith, like we were, we've said in the previous class lecture, we need to constantly nurture and develop. So, you know, um, just as an example, okay, and the Bible, there's no, there's no scripture on this, but just an example, illustration. Faith can be considered like a muscle, right? Because faith works, right? So muscle, you need muscle to do work. So spiritually, faith can be considered like a muscle. So the muscle can be developed, uh, uh, but for the muscle to develop, you need to give it the right food, the body. You need to give the body the right food. You need to give it the right exercise. You need to give it the right rest. So all three are important uh, in order for that muscle or for muscles in the body to develop. Right? So just an just example. right? So similarly, uh, our faith needs to be developed. It needs to be nurtured. So in this lesson, it's a very short lesson, um, uh, I'm just going to share some just what the Bible teaches us about nurturing our faith, of how we can grow or develop in our faith. And remember, this we're talking about is our personal faith, right? That God has given to all of us a measure of faith. Romans 12, verse 3, when we all started, he's given it to us. But now we need to nurture that faith. And uh, a simple example is in what we see and how Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, right? Very interesting to observe this. Uh, he, you know, he commends in both his episodes, First Thessalonians and also in Second Thessalonians, he commends these group of believers uh, about their faith. He really commends them, right? But at the same time, he wants to help them grow in their faith. Right? That's part of what he desires for them. So we can just look at these two passages of scripture. Uh, could somebody please read for us uh, these scripture passages? First Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, verses 2 to 4, and also verse 8. And then First Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, please. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Uh, verse 8, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. Chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Mm, thank you. So, you know, so Paul is commending these believers. I mean, he's really very happy for them. He said, look, we are praying for you, and we are remembering your work of faith. So these people, these believers here in this city, Thessalonica, or this region, um, he says, look, we really appreciate your work of faith. So they are putting their faith to work. They are doing something. Uh, they're expressing love through their labor, their hope through their patience, and their faith through their work. So he's really commending them. And he says, you know, uh, uh, people in other places, in Macedonia, in Achaia, they're, they're talking about these 
you know, the, these people's faith in God, right? So um, in other places, people are talking about these believers. And that's like I say, hey, these, these believers are they're wonderful. They're wonderful people of faith. They have this great faith in God. They're firm in their faith, etc., etc. So that's in chapter one. Now, just a little later in chapter three, Paul says, you know what? We are praying for you. And we want to come see your face. We want to visit you and perfect what is lacking in your faith. See that? Perfect, mature, strengthen what's lacking in your faith. So while he's commending them for their faith, their work of faith, and the fact that many people are talking about their faith, which is wonderful, there's still more work to be done. Right? So he says, look, I still want to come to you I still want to meet you in person, all of you in person. I want to come there personally, that I may see you, and I made perfect or mature what is lacking. Right? That means there's still more that can be done, you know, to help them increase in their faith, help them strengthen in their faith. Right? So for all of us. For all of us, we might, can constantly perfect what is lacking in our faith. Right? None of us have arrived. None of us are perfect. None of us, you know, are these great people who can say, "Well, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I've got perfect faith, complete faith." No, uh, we are working our faith. Uh, uh, our faith is producing, but there it can get better. It can get stronger. It can be nurtured. It can be perfected. And so that is some, that's something we need to be conscious about. We need to be aware about and constantly work towards nurturing our faith and perfecting our faith, right? So that's what, uh, uh, that's the focus here, right? In, uh, and uh, in the next episode, Second Thessalonians 1, 3 and 4, uh, Paul writes again to the same Thessalonians, uh, uh, somebody could read these, yeah, these two verses, please, again. Second Thessalonians 1, 3 to 4. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Thank you. So, so he's saying, you know, uh, once again, he's writing this, you know, to these same people. Uh, the second epistle, he says, you know, we're thanking God because your faith grows exceedingly. That means, like, you know, uh, like we said earlier, he said, look, you've got one, your working faith, you've got your faith toward God. We want to perfect it. We want to strengthen it. And now he's writing back. He's saying, "Look, your faith is growing. You know, it's growing, and uh, we are uh, we are appreciating your faith and patience." And they were facing difficulties and hardships, and so he's appreciating them. The point I want to point, uh, you know, really point point out is their faith grows, and so our faith can grow, right? And we need to keep growing our faith. So. That's the focus of this chapter. It's a very simple chapter in uh, how we nurture our faith, right? Some basic things. There's nothing complicated, actually. It's very, very simple. First of all, we must nurture our faith with the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 is a scripture that we all know. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Or it's just an old English way of saying, faith comes by hearing the word of God, right? Uh, so how does faith come? We must hear the word of God. We must hear what God has spoken, right? So, and, and, and notice it is a present continuous hearing, right? So faith comes by hearing, present continuous, the word of God. So how do we nurture our faith? We hear or continually hear continue to hear the word of God. Why? Because we trust God by trusting his word or 
We show our faith in God by having faith in his word, what God has spoken. God has promised this. God has said this. Therefore, I believe it. I have faith in it. Right? That word produces faith, and my faith in it is my faith in God. So we constantly engage with the word. Right? We uh, keep hearing the word so that our faith in God can be strengthened. Let me see. Somebody has a question. Yes, Sean, you have a question, please. Yeah, it was just, I, I still don't understand where it says perfect, what is lacking your faith. I know First Thessalonians 9, 10, is, towards the end, it says perfect, what is lacking your faith. I don't understand that part. Right. So, so what Paul is sh showing us is, you know, our faith can grow, right? Now, I think, I think we can use an example. So the, the, the word um, perfect um, is, uh, there are, of course, different uh, ways to look at it. One perfect is to complete, to fill up, to fill up. So, you know, if you think of a, uh, a, a, a glass uh, that has uh, a cup, a cup that has water, say three fourths of the way. To perfect means to fill up the rest of the cup. So you're adding some more. So it's not full. You know, three three quarters of the way. So I perfect. What do I do? I fill up what's lacking. You know, fill it up, top it up. So that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at, understand the word perfect is mature, mature. So the example would be that of a, an 18 year old and let's say maybe a 25 year old. Now an 18 year old, you know, typically by the time you're 18, you are considered, a person is considered an adult is an adult, 18. But there's a difference between an adult who's 18 and an adult who's say 25, because uh, an adult who's 25 has, uh, uh, you know, usually has a little bit more maturity. They've seen a little bit more of life. Maybe they've carried a little bit more responsibility. Um, and, and, and therefore, has a little bit more maturity to them. Now, both are adults, both are considered adults, 18 or 25. They're legally adults. But in terms of maturity, there is a difference, simply because a 25-year-old, uh, you know, over the next seven years has carried a certain amount of responsibility. Maybe they've started working, a job, and, you know, all of that. And uh, they're more mature. So the word perfect can also be understood as uh, the sense of maturity, right? So uh, now in the exercise of our faith, uh, we need the stopping up or we need this maturity to happen. And that's what Paul is referring to. He says, I want to perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now, we don't know exactly what, in what ways this group, these believers here in Thessalonica were lacking in their faith, um, whether it was they were being shaken because of um, the persecutions they were facing or was it because of um, some of the disturbances that were happening? Because when you read the letter, like First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, there are certain things Paul talks about. For instance, he talks about persecutions, hardships. He talks about uh, the need for holiness. He also talks about people who are uh, busybodies, who are you know going around and causing uh, this, especially in chapter three of Second Thessalonians, they're causing a lot of disturbance in that community. So, in what way were these people lacking in their faith? Exactly what Paul is referring to, I don't know. But, you know, I'm just looking at the other things he mentions in both these letters. 
uh, 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 of the challenges, the problems these people are facing. Uh, and uh, there's also another important thing he addresses is about the coming of Christ, um, that um, they should be ready. You know, So I'm not sure in which specific area these people were being were lacking in their faith, but he says, look, I need to come and help you in this way. I need to really strengthen you in this way. Uh, but if those two examples, like topping up or maturing helps, uh, understand, I hope, hope it does. Is it okay, Shani, or? Yes, it's okay, it's clear, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, so we need to constantly, you know, keep growing in our faith in God. Uh, uh, and, you know, for different ones of us, right? Uh, there could be different things that are challenging our faith. You know, um, sometimes it could be just difficulties we are facing and, hey, we need some help. Sometimes it could be temptations. Everything is going great in life. You know, there's no problem, but there are temptations. So, hey, we need help in our faith to overcome temptation. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, things may be going great, but we need faith in God to step out and accomplish something. So, you know, there's no problem. You know, all, our, all your needs are met, everything is fine, but a, a, a believer could be hesitating to step out and do something for God. So, okay, hey, you need to perfect faith in that area so that you step out and do something. So uh, for all of us, right, in, as we are journeying through life, we need help to nurture our faith for, for various things. You know, I, I'm not saying it always has to do with difficulty. Sometimes it does, the, we will be facing difficulty. But sometimes, you know, life can be perfect. Everything is fine. You know, you have no needs, all your needs are met. Uh, life is going great, You've got, your health is good. But then there could be the need to nurture faith in certain other aspects, like, like I said, overcoming temptation or stepping out and doing something for God or stepping out and ministering to people, you know, learning how to move in the gifts of the Spirit, learning how to do different things God has called us to do. So, you know, although, you know, so this nurturing of our faith doesn't always have to do with problems or with difficulties. It could just be that we need to grow in other areas of our walk with God, our relationship with God, right? So all of us need this continual nurturing of our faith. How do we do it? First, we said, we can do it by just hearing the word, right? And so I want to encourage us to learn to meditate in the word of God. And we'll be talking about this uh, in another course as well when we talk about hermeneutics. But let me just, you know, give us uh, a, in, a, in a very brief, concise way, how to meditate in the word of God. Okay. Now, when we say meditation, uh, we're not talking about some Eastern mysticism. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about biblical meditation. You know, the word meditate in God's in, is used many times in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. And uh, how how did they practice meditation in God's word? Right? Especially if you're talking about biblical meditation. Uh, you can capture when you when you study the Hebrew words haga and siak, you know, the word haga simply means to reflect, imagine, mutter, or speak. And siak simply means to ponder as well as to converse with oneself, to commune. To utter. So when you look at these two Hebrew words used for meditation, and you want to just distill what it's saying in three English words, we use the words contemplation, visualization, and confession. Okay, so how do I meditate in God's word? Three simple things. Contemplate. Contemplate means to think deeply on the word of God. Your attention is focused 
on that promise. You're thinking on it. Contemplate. Contemplation. Second, visualization. I use the English word visualization. I mean, you could use another word like imagine or imagination. Or, that means you're seeing God's word fulfilled with your mind, with your mind's eye. Right? Uh, uh, because God created our imagination. He gave it to us. And our imagination is very important because the picture we paint with our mind's eye can inspire faith, it can build confidence, or it can destroy us. And you find this example, you find this in the Bible too. And, uh, you know, we will talk about it in, like I said, in another course. But this imagination is, is important. So you need to see with your mind's eye the word of God being fulfilled in your life. God gave you imagination. He gave us the faculty or the ability to imagine, which is to see with our mind's eye. And thirdly is confession. That means I must speak the word. Declare the word. That means put it in my mouth. Right? Because Haga and Siak, you'll see, it means to mutter, it means to repeat words, it means to say aloud, it means to utter. So, you know, the way the Hebrew Hebrews or the Jews practiced it was they would, you know, sit in a corner, they would put a shawl around them, they would rock back and forth, full focus on the word, and they will say the word of God, you know. So example, Psalm 23. So imagine I'm meditating on Psalm 23. I'm not saying we had to do it like this. I'm just saying that's generally how it was practiced, right? They would they would block out all distractions and just meditate, contemplate, visualize, confess. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He, or I must forget the rest of it. <laughs> he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Right? So, what are they doing? They're meditating God's word. They're contemplating, that means your attention is focused on the word. In your mind, you're seeing that word. The Lord is my shepherd. You see yourself as a sheep and you see how the shepherd leads the sheep and you're going by the green pastures, you're going by the still waters, you're seeing, you know, you, 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 you visualize, you're seeing that word. And then you're also saying it with your mouth. Why? Now your, your ears are hearing what your mouth is speaking and faith comes by hearing. Right, so you can you know open the scriptures, take a verse you know take Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, and say okay. So I have my Bible open. I'm looking at this verse. I say God has said, I know the thoughts I think toward you says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. God has told me. He knows thoughts that he's thinking towards me. These are thoughts of peace, of blessing, of well-being, not of evil. To give me a future and a hope. I, I declare that my God knows the thoughts he has for me. Thoughts of peace and well-being. To give me a future and a hope. This is my God. So what I have done is just now, I've meditated in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Just a few minutes. What was I doing? I was contemplating. I was visualizing. I was saying. I was muttering. I was saying just to myself. What's this going to do? 
it's going to feed my spirit with the word of God. Meditation in God's word. And it's going to build my faith in God's word. And I'm meditating, I'm thinking on it. It's focused. God, this is what you said. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Okay. Similarly, as I'm meditating, as we are meditating the word, what's happening is we are sowing the seed of God's word in our hearts. You know, Jesus taught us this in the parable of the sower. He said that the seed, the word is like seed. It has to be sown, right? So through meditation, you're putting the seed of the word into your heart. And from there, it's going to germinate. It's going to produce, right? So hearing, speaking, meditating, and practicing the word, it's a key to nurturing our faith. It's key, right? So I hear the word, I meditate through meditating, I speak the word to myself, and we do this consistently, do it over and over again. It nurtures and strengthens our faith. And sometimes, you know, there may be uh, areas in our life where you want to, you know, you want to go after something really specific. You spend that extra time meditating in those scriptures for that. Uh, area of your life and build yourself up in that area. Okay, so first step, first way to nurture your faith is by hearing the word, by through meditating and just putting the word in your heart. Uh, I want to pause you and see if there are any questions. Uh, did you, did you all understand? Okay, so clear? All right. Everybody's very quiet, so I'm assuming it's okay. Then just, to, just two more. The next thing is we nurture our faith by being part of a community of faith, right? So this is, again, uh, uh, a simple, and important part of being a person of faith, right? So Philemon, there's only one chapter in the sixth verse. He, Philemon, Paul writes, and he says, you know, he tells the, he's writing to Philemon, he says that the sharing of your faith or the fellowship of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So he's talking about the fellowship of your faith. Yeah, so that means my faith is not held in isolation, but there is a fellowship. That means I'm having faith. There are other people around me who also have faith in God, um, who also have, uh, who just who also believe in God and believe his word. And so now we are having fellowship. We are, we are sharing our faith, right? And uh, how, how can that fellowship be effective? We must acknowledge the good things that are in us in Christ. So be a part of a community that, that acknowledges the good things that are in us in Christ. You have to acknowledge the good things, right? So be a part of that community. And that as, as you're part of those that community of believers who are acknowledging the good things that are in us in Christ. What happens? It encourages our faith because you see how another brother or another sister, how that person is, uh, you know, journeying with faith in God and they encourage you, their life encourages you or maybe their testimony encourages you or how God does works that encourage you and it strengthens our faith, right? So being part of a community, be a part of people who acknowledge good, the good things that are in us in Christ. Then, the fellowship of our faith becomes effective. It, it really strengthens our faith. It's a simple thing, but yet it's a very important thing to nurture our faith. And last one is nurture your faith with testimonies of faith, right? So listen to 
you know, listen to people as they share their testimony. Hey, this is how God encouraged, God worked in my life. And I believe God and God came through and, you know, God did this. And so by testimonies of faith, our faith is also nurtured and encouraged. Now, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, for example, is a, is a chapter that's full of testimonies, full of, uh, you know, people who walked in faith and uh, what they were able to accomplish by faith. So we nurture our faith with the testimonies, you know, of people around us who are able to do things uh, through faith in God. And we talk about his wondrous works and we, uh, you know, we declare his mighty acts. And so those, by listening to that, by listening to people talking about his wondrous works and declaring his mighty acts, our faith is also strengthened. Okay? So three simple things. You nurture your faith with the word of God. Feed your spirit with the word. Be a part of a community of believers who call out the good things that are in you in Christ Jesus. Not people who are feeding you with unbelief and doubt, but people who, you know, acknowledge the good things that are in you in Christ. Third, listen to testimonies of faith. Right? So this is just a simple way to nurture our faith in God. Okay? All right, if you have a question, please go ahead. Yes, Pastor, thank you. Uh, so my question is uh, regarding being part of a community of faith. Uh, so uh, if uh, a, a believer is part of a community that agrees on the basic doctrine, you know, the basic gospel, uh, but they do differ in certain doctrines, uh, how should a believer deal with that right so uh, you know the basic gospel everything is clear and there is no um, uh, nothing uh, that is concerning but if it is like regarding holy spirit and you know the extension you know that we have in the gospel so in such cases what what would you suggest uh, be a good way Mm. Yeah, there is no, you know, one straight answer in the sense, um, ultimately, you know, each one has to uh, follow what God wants to do. But I'll just give my general guidance in this matter. See, uh, one, it is possible that, you know, I could go to a, 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 a church, a community, a local church, a com local community of believers who you know, who we agree with in the basic things, like we all believe in Jesus, we all believe in the God of the Bible, the triune God, we believe the scriptures are, you know, inspired word, but uh, they may not believe in, say, you know, the works of the Spirit and the supernatural manifestations of the Spirit and so on. I mean, it's okay for, you know, a believer to go there as long as on his own, he's able to grow and develop in those things. Yeah? Uh, he can manage so that kind of a life can be managed. I'm not saying it's not possible. It can be managed. But this believer needs expression. He needs, you know, to, to be able to learn more about the things of God, the Spirit of God, and to be able to minister and serve, you know. Uh, and that can happen, and that should happen, in the context of that local community of believers, or they can go and be a part of another fellowship. So, you know, maybe they can compensate that way there. Although in that local church, they may not have room for expression. Maybe being, being part of another Bible study or another group, they're, they're growing and so on. So they kind of compensate. And I, I know, you know, sometimes some people do that. It's not the ideal situation. It can be managed. It's okay. The ideal would be to be a part of a church where, you know, like we read in Philemon 1 6, you're able to flow together, you're able to grow together in all aspects of the Christian faith, you know, to grow in the things of the Spirit. And that would be ideal. 
But if that is not possible, you know, for various reasons, if that's not possible, then this this is a second option where uh, it can be managed so that in the local church there is community and there is fellowship to the extent that people uh, believe. But the, but the believer at a personal level is able to grow by engaging in other, you know, other places of fellowship or risk input, grow and continue to grow in the faith. So that can be managed. Uh, but ideal is always good if, if it is possible. But in some situations, it may not be possible. Uh, practically so, it's okay. Okay, Pastor. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So we're going to just start off on our next lesson. Uh, so chapter 9 was very small, simple, on nurturing your faith by the word, by fellowship with believers, and third, by listening to testimonies. Now we go to chapter 10, um, where you want to talk about how do you, what is the basis for strong faith, right? When you and I want to be able to exercise faith in God, we need to have a strong foundation. What is the basis for strong faith? How can you be a person? How, you, how can you and I be people of strong faith? What is it that undergirds strong faith? Okay, that's what we want to talk about in chapter 10, uh, right? And so we're kind of getting into some of the practical things here about faith in God and how to exercise faith. We will talk about it, right? So what is the basis for strong faith? Chapter 10. Right, so the basis for strong faith, right? So in this chapter, we'll mention five important foundational truths that you and I must have for strong faith. Secondly, and then we're also going to talk about practices to develop strong faith, okay? So what are the foundational truths we... <clears throat> We must be strong in to have strong faith. First of all, we must be established in the integrity of God's word. Right? If if we are not confident that this word is truth, that this word will not fail, then we cannot have strong faith. So, first thing to have strong faith is hey, God has spoken. God said it, it's going to be done. Nothing can stop the word of God from being fulfilled. So we must be established in the integrity of the word of God, and the power of the word of God. It must be settled in our lives, no questions. Because if I doubt the word, then I can't have faith in God. If I question the promise of God, I can't have faith in God. I have to be established and the integrity of God's word. So let me uh, let me sorry um, share my screen. No, I didn't I didn't share my screen. Right. So we're going to talk about five important foundational truths and four practices. Right. So the first one I must be established in the integrity of God's word. Right. Jesus said John seventeen seventeen, Your word is truth. I must be able to say, God, your word is truth. I believe in God. You said it, that's enough for me. That's enough for me. God, you said it. Right? So we must have this confidence. You know, Things will around us will change. The grass withers, the flower fades. Time and seasons will change. But the word of God will stand. Things will change, but God's word will endure. So we must be established, number one, we must be established in the integrity of God's word. Okay, we have to have this holy reverence. We have to have this absolute confidence in the holy word of God. This is God's word. Strong faith 
is based on this truth, the word of God. Okay, so every promise, all the promises of God are yes and amen. I'm not questioning it. I'm not doubting it. If it's there in the Bible, it's for me. If God has spoken it, it's for me, it's truth. It must be established in the integrity of God's word. Second, we must be established in Christ's finished work on the cross. So the cross of Jesus Christ is the basis for everything we're going to receive from God. Everything we're going to receive from God is because of the cross, what Jesus did for us on the cross. So we must be established in that. Okay, on the cross, my sins are forgiven. The power of sin is broken. Jesus provided wholeness for my spirit, soul, and body. So I can receive healing and wholeness for my spirit, soul, and body. The curse has been removed. Blessing has been released through the cross. Satan, all his demonic forces have been disarmed and destroyed. I am redeemed and I'm part of God's family. Right? So the cross is so important because it's on the basis of the cross that we are going to receive from God. So I must be very clear and I must be established in the finished work. This is done. Jesus finished the work for me on the cross. Right? And all these aspects that we've just kind of outlined here, we must be firmly established in that. The third truth we must be established is our identity in Christ. That's what we are learning in, in the other course. We have to be established in this because we have to live out of the identity in Christ. That because God has given me this inheritance, because God has given me this identity, I can therefore face life, face situations, face Satan and his demons based on that. So when a believer is established in their identity, they have confidence. They don't doubt, you know, they don't, um, they can go before God boldly and ask, knowing that that's their privilege. It's their blessing. It's part of their inheritance. And so, this is also very important. You know, if you are established in your identity in Christ, you can operate out of that as you exercise faith in God. Okay. And number four, I must be established in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit is at work with me. So when I'm believing God, when I'm believing God for healing or believing God for deliverance or believing God for ministering to somebody, I know I'm not alone. You know you're not alone. The Holy Spirit is working through you. The Holy Spirit is working in you. And so you're established. You say, I know the Holy Spirit is going to help me. I know the Holy Spirit is going to bring me through this. I know the Holy Spirit is going to cause that miracle to take place. So you're established in that, the presence of the Holy Spirit, because that undergirds us. We can have strong faith when we know what the Holy Spirit does in us and through us. Okay. And lastly, number five, the authority of Jesus' name. That when we minister, when we pray, we're doing it in the name of Jesus. And what does that mean for us? You know, that as we minister, look, I'm not doing it in my name. I'm not doing it in the name of a church or a denomination or something like that. No, it's the name of Jesus. So when we are established in the authority of the name of Jesus, we can have strong faith as you minister out of that name. Okay. So in order to have strong faith, in order to be, you know, uh, to be people of strong faith. Let's just review this. These truths undergird strong faith. They are foundational to having strong faith in God. 
reviewing, number one, be established in the integrity of God's word. Number two, be established in the finished work on the cross. What Jesus did for me, it's God's provision for my life. I will have it. No devil and no man can stop it. Must have that confidence. Number three, know your identity in Christ. This is who God has made me to be. This is what he has given to me. I'm going to walk in it. Number four, the Holy Spirit is with me. He's my helper. He's going to help me and he's going to work through me. Number five, I've been given the authority of Jesus' name. And so in that name, as I pray or as I minister or as I ask, I know it has to be done. So I'm going to pause here for today. And so you see how strong faith is undergirded by these things. So, you know, when we are established in all these truths, and if you look at how, you know, the courses are set up for us in the Bible college, it's really, it's kind of building you up in all these areas. It's building you up in the Holy Spirit. It's building you up in the Word of God. It's building you up in the, you know, in all these areas. It's kind of building you up, really, to give you a strong foundation so that you, you and I can have strong faith. Strong faith. Any questions so far before we close and dismiss? We'll continue this next week. Any questions? Okay. Let's uh, close in prayer. Okay, if you have a question, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. So my question is, so all these uh, five points that were mentioned, uh, these are all... Um, uh, you know, based on God's word, uh, the name of Jesus, all that God has done. So I was just wondering, like, what is is there anything that is dependent on me as a believer or me as a person? Is there anything about faith that is dependent on me? Mm. Um, I would say the next part where we're going to talk about the practices. So those practices are things that we do, right? So if we practice those things, it'll help us have strong faith. So while God has done his part, and he's given us you know, these, all these truths for us to just uh, cast ourselves on, say, God, I'm just completely dependent on these truths. God has provided that for us, but then, on the other side, he says, live like this. You know, you practice this. So I would say those five, the five practices we're going to talk about is our, our side of uh, this whole having strong faith. Our side to having strong faith. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Good. Thank you, everybody. Let's just close in prayer. Um, can I ask somebody to... Please pray with us and uh, dismiss us. Anybody, you're welcome to unmute your mic and just pray with us as a class and we will dismiss, please. Anyone? Um, Brother Manor, would you like to yeah. go ahead? Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for teaching the precious truths about the faith, Lord. How we can grow in faith. Nurture our faith, Lord. Lord, so precious are these things. Help every one of us, Father, to receive it with a good heart and to develop it, Father. These truths may be deeply rooted in us so that it may bear much fruit, Father. Thank you, Lord, for granting this privilege. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to, for the seed of this truth growing in our life. 
We praise your name and thank you. Glorify you. Grand day. Bachelor's grace to every one of us all to grow perfectly in all these elements of faith, Father. Nurturing our faith. Bless the pastor, Lord. Bless every one of us. We commit every one of us into thy hand. Thank you, Lord, for making us your true children and your living witnesses in this world. That we may shine for you in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will dismiss. Have a good rest of the day. Enjoy your day. God bless you. I'll see you again.